Hello and welcome to IHBC at COP26, Conserving Buildings and Places Conserves Our Planet. Today we're joined by Adala Leeson and Douglas Phillips. Adala is Head of Socioeconomic Analysis and Evaluation at Historic England. She leads Historic England's social and economic research in the production of Heritage Counts, the annual audit of the historic environment. Adela is part of the emerging DCMS Culture and Heritage Capital Steering and Working Groups and a member of the Climate Heritage Network. Prior to joining Historic England, Adela worked as an associate economic consultant for 10 years, working with public and private clients on planning and regeneration projects. She has also worked in academia as a researcher at the London School of Economics. Douglas is Senior Environmental Analyst at Historic England. He has helped lead on the organization's research interests in carbon and energy, particularly around the embodied and operational emissions of retrofit. In addition to his MSc degrees in Sustainable Energy and Environment from Cardiff University and Low Carbon Technologies from the University of Leeds, he completed his PhD in 2018. With his background in engineering before moving to Historic England, Douglas worked in strategic consulting, specializing in the circular economy and the bioenergy sector. Well, thank you both for joining us today. Thanks for having us. I'd like to start by asking you both to tell us a bit about yourselves, how you got started, and why you're passionate about sustainability and conservation. Yeah, so I'm, I'm happy to start. Thank you so much for having us. It's a privilege to be here. Um, I guess for me, I, I, I was lucky enough to grow up in Kenya as well as in Sweden. And in both those places, there is such a close connection between humans and nature. Um, sometimes extremely positive, but also sometimes very negative. And I think that has always colored um, my direction of travel. I also had a grandfather who was a warden in the forest nearby where we lived in Sweden. So I've always had kind of been very close to nature and I've therefore just naturally somehow progressed into studying environmental economics and economics. Um, and then I've arrived um, into the heritage sector about seven years ago and again, that connection we have to nature, to the environment, is really critical and it's part of our everyday lives. And I think that just experiencing that is how I've come to really want to know more and to think more about the solutions and mitigations. Um, and I'm really positive about where we can go if we put effort in at this early stage. Yeah. and. Um... I've had an interesting uh, sort of pathway into into this role, and I could probably spend 20, 30 minutes talking about just how I got to, to, to this position. But um, it was that sort of interest of um, being outside and being in the environment that led me to do my undergraduate in forestry, and then through many different sort of uh, uh, stops in, in my life, I ended up deciding I, I wanted to do something uh, that, that makes a difference and I think that's been the thing that's really sort of pushed me um, in, into this area really is that I, I want to make a difference it might only be a small small difference um, and making tiny changes is something that I uh, quite live by but um, yeah it's all pushed me into doing my master's and going on to study further and, and, and get my doctorate and then um, moving uh, sectors as well I, I started in in a different sector and the opportunity came to, to to move to historic england and i think it's really important to have a wider understanding of how different sectors work and interact with one another so it was a, an opportunity that i jumped at and through the last couple of years getting a, a real appreciation for, for, for heritage and sustainability and conservation and bringing some of the skill set that i have from a different sector i i hope i've helped to make time changes yeah, fantastic. Um, Adela, you presented in the 2020 IHPC Annual School, and I remember you talking about the sort of question of whether or not to quantify heritage values and ultimately making what I thought was a very compelling case that we should, because uh, if you don't do it, uh, heritage just sort of gets sidelined and, you know, sort of ignored. Do you think there's a sort of related situation here where oftentimes heritage values have not been included in the conversation about solutions to climate change because there's maybe an unwillingness or an inability to quantify it? Yeah, absolutely. I think we really, really underestimate heritage and sometimes we don't even count it. Um, and because I'm an optimist, I would say it's not about unwillingness. It's much, much more about inability. Um, 
And the argument we make is this. So heritage has value. It has value to people. It has value to communities and to societies at large. But those values are multiple. They're multidimensional. They include social, they include economic and environmental values. But using our conventional methods, the methods we're used to, the orthodox methods, particularly within economics, it is difficult to measure these values. But we are at a place now where increasingly there is a growing number of voices that are saying we have to do the difficult thing. Um, we're seeing much more data out there, much more data available, and we know that we need to start analysing and using this information in different ways. Um, and the case we make in terms of, um, and I'm approaching this from an economics perspective, is that in, in very simple terms, in economics, if something satisfies people's preferences, it's said to have economic value. And that value is often quantified in monetary terms and revolves around a market price. Um, and, you know, heritage has those values. So, for example, people pay for a membership or a ticket price to visit a, a heritage asset. So we're, we're really good at doing those things. And it is to the credit of economics as a science that that idea of market value, market prices or GDP dominates um, the, our understanding of value. But it is an incomplete measure of heritage values because when we talk about heritage, we are thinking about the spiritual value, the aesthetic value, the beauty, the architectural value, how distinct and unique those assets are. And very, very importantly, the social value. So it tells us about our identity, our collective identity, our sense of belonging. And it's really important to understand that heritage also has unique environmental values. And we've been studying this most recently um, through our Heritage Counts research and really looking at the built historic environment and the embodied carbon in the, in the built environment. Um, and embodied carbon is the greenhouse gas emissions that are generated when we build assets through the extraction, manufacture, processing, transport, and assembly of different elements of the built environment. But we don't count embodied carbon and we don't count it well today in, when we consider the carbon emissions from the built environment. But we know that embodied carbon emissions can account for as much as 50% of a building's emissions over 50 years. So these are really, really big numbers we're talking about. And these are emissions that occur even before a building is occupied. So if we don't count embodied carbon, there is an understanding then, or a stereotype that historic buildings are inefficient compared to new uh, buildings because we only count a segment which is the in-use operational carbon of buildings. But if we were to count the whole embodied and operational carbon, our research has shown that your conclusions are far, far different. And actually, in some cases, historic buildings emit less carbon compared to a new building. So for us, counting the entirety, the value from an economic a social and environmental perspective is really, really critical if we are going to start to address this really humongous issue that is affecting all societies, our global community, which is climate change. We have to be able to understand the big picture. It is complex, but there are methods, there are techniques out there that we can start to adopt and we need to move quickly so for me, from an economic perspective, what we tend to talk about is market failure, that there just are these, there is a lack of information. And that's why I think it's more about inability rather than unwillingness um, to count these things. But I'm optimistic that with a bit more work, a bit harder work, quick, we need to move quickly, 
and I'm talking from a public sector perspective, but private firms are also in the same position and they're starting to think about this and take this really seriously. And I think we can start seeing movement in the next two years. I mean, yeah, hard, hard to treat buildings you often come across. It sort of speaks to that inability to quantify. And digging into the carbon a little bit more, I know Historic England's recently published a couple of papers, Understanding Carbon in the Historic Environment, Valuing Carbon in Pre-1919 Residential Buildings. So it seems like you are digging into this sort of institutionally. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, what the findings are from those papers and, and just go into a little bit why it's so important when you're looking at maybe retrofitting a historic building, why you understand carbon very well and, and, and how it plays in? Yeah, so this sort of like um, feeds into a lot of what Darla's just been talking about there. And um, until fairly recently, the, the, the main focus has always been on, on the operational emissions. So um, looking at ways to reduce emissions around energy efficiency. So reducing, uh, well, replacing your lights with more energy efficient lights, those types of con conversation. But the embodied carbon um, until about, well, less than 10 years ago, it wasn't really a, a, a sort of widely accepted or talked about thing. and over the over the last decade, that has started to change. A lot more research has, has gone into that and understanding that. But the the conversation has still always been more he heavily weighted towards that energy efficiency and operational element. So the the the, the, the publication of um, oh, the, the the first piece of work that we got to publish on understanding carbon in the historic environment wanted to try and put embodied carbon towards the front of the conversation and really sort of um, increase that level of understanding um, around that, which um, it's complex in, in a way in, in, in that um, there, there are lots of elements to that, but um, understanding that fundamentally that um, a, a building doesn't just exist without carbon having been um, used in the pr processing and getting it to that point, just having that acceptance that, that, that that's a thing, um, I think is really important. And then as we go on and, and try to quantify that, and, and that's what um, that, that first uh, piece of work really was about was raising the awareness around embodied carbon and the importance of that, especially in relation to historic buildings that have been around for hundreds of years. What well, more than um, a fifth of all homes in England um, are over 100 years old. There's, we've got probably well one of the most diverse um, building stocks within Europe and one of the oldest building stocks um, in, in Europe as well. So it's it, it's really important that that level that the understanding and, and, and the data and the information and the evidence and support of embodied carbon is 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 discussed and i, I think that that first um, piece of work was really well received and and it did start to shine that light that there is a, a carbon price paid when you build a building as, as adala was saying through that um the extraction of materials the transportation of those materials to um, the processing plant, the transportation of that to the construction site, in the actual physical construction, there's a, a there's an embodied well, there's a carbon price that's already been paid just to get that building in, into place. So when you start to think about demolishing that and going through that whole process again, and with the demolishing, there's carbon uh, emissions associated with that, and with how you then deal with those building materials that you've just uh, brought down. So. You, all of a sudden you get to a point where you have a new building but you've accrued all of these emissions and it can take years and years for those um, energy efficiency savings through your improved lighting and, and the heating um, to even get to a point where you're back to, to, to that original level of carbon and that's what especially that first piece it really sort of shows that retrofitting and, and finding a way to um, work with the existing building stock which has under uh, um yeah which, which is there which has stood the, the test of time it's it's hundreds of years old working with that and making that more efficient um you can see those emission reductions and we only have a small period of time to work with it it is not as if we have um, like net zero targets for the 2050 we've got 30 years and there is a lot to be done within within those 30 years and it's when you start think we can't build our way out of uh, build our way to net zero we have to sort of work within what we have and adapting reusing recycling and and and, and making the most of our existing building stock and it is going to be a key key part of that and um that's the main sort of thrust of what we wanted really with that research 
and because it was so um that that first piece was was so widely sort of like there was a real good sort of acceptance around that it sort of prompted us we wanted to do more with it we didn't want it to just sort of be a piece of work that then um people may re refer to it every now and then we wanted to build upon that so the second piece of work um was designed to sort of look more holistic holistically at that so not only taking in, into consideration the embodied carbon but also those operational emissions that uh, operational emission savings that can be achieved um, through retrofitting um, older buildings and adapting and, and reusing um, existing buildings is is a key part of what we're trying to do with net zero that we want to have those conversations with the wider sector and that it can form a, a key part of the future and and how heritage can sort of um push that forward and i, I won't go through all of the <laughs> the results from from that research because there are so many pieces of research right. work there um but i think a, a lot of the takeaway is um around that it's feasibly possible there's um which i think is an important starting point um there's a big conversation to be had around how people use buildings and and um the the, the how yeah how we consume energy and how, how we live within our buildings and that's not just coming from our sector that's you look at um the national grid's projections for getting to 2050 and changing consumer behavior and how people use buildings is a key part of reaching that. Um, so that's something that needs to be talked about now, sooner rather than later, in how we sort of live and work and and and, and use our buildings. So um, the research picked up on, on some of that. And there is also a cost element to it. This isn't something that's uh, going to be easy to do from a financial perspective. And, there needs to be some level of mechanisms that go into support in doing that. Um, and we need to have a probably a frank conversation about how, how we go about funding that. And um, we've seen this week um, strategies from, from the UK government, and they do touch upon how, how things will be funded. But there, there is support required for that. But I think the main takeaway is that it's achievable, it's doable, and um, we should be doing it. Great. And, and you know, as we move towards net zero and, and we're looking at this, this sort of transition that you're talking about towards the green economy, how then does uh, does having this understanding of sort of heritage values, um, you know, Dali, you had mentioned sort of communal values and the social values, you know, what, what role does that play in helping to ensure that that this process, this transitional process, you know, you hear just transition, sort of these concepts, but how do we make sure that, you know, it's effective and, and good for communities and society? I think where we are, and again, I'm approaching it from an economic perspective because I think it's a really important one. Um, we understand that our current economic system, which is often labelled a neoliberal economic system, um, which is very much about capitalism and market price and GDP, that has resulted in some very, very good outcomes. You know, we've seen um, extreme world poverty has reduced gradually over the last 25 years. Of course, the COVID pandemic is going to have an impact on that. Um, so they, and we have seen growth and, you know, we, we live, and most people live well, in particular within the Western uh, countries. But what we've also seen is this absolute growth in inequalities, in uh, wealth inequalities, health inequalities, income inequalities. And those are part of the economic system that we currently have. And the reason behind that is these things are not embedded in those models. They're not a critical element of our, of our successful outcomes. Equally, of course, what we're talking about in terms of climate change and the decline of resource and extraction and the growth of uh, greenhouse gases, all those things are also part of this kind of pursuit of an economic growth model that doesn't consider that resources are finite um, before they enter the economic system. So it's kind of quite clear that <laughs> the way forward, the way we achieve a good outcome is to bed those two critical elements into our system. And until we do that, we will continue to see losses and eventually, we have some really bad outcomes that the IPCC, for example, have um, demonstrated, including in the UK, the CCC. Um, so 
so we really need to change. And I think what Dougie was saying there is, you know, we can, we can do things, but there is also an urgency behind these things. And there is such a strong link between uh, well-being, people's well-being, um, people's welfare and the environment, um, as is, of course, to the e economy. So we have to start kind of having a bit more parity um, in these things. And there are some really interesting, I, I would say economics is in a bit of a state of flux. There's lots of interesting theories that are coming forward. And green economy is is one of those. We have a circular economy model that we talk about. There is donut economics, um, evolutionary economics, ecological economics. There are all these kind of really interesting theories. We get to see kind of one bubbling up to the surface, but maybe it's because the future is a little bit different that um, there isn't a one size fits all that we need to start using these different models. But ultimately, the goal is to make sure that people and the environment are part of that metric of what success is. So at the moment, GDP is kind of king, um, and arguably, but we need to kind of move towards something else. I think in New Zealand, they're talking about well-being budgets where they have kind of um, a dashboard, if you like, a dashboard of metrics that constitute success. Um, the, the, the UN have their sustainable development goals. That also just gives you an idea that actually success economics is economic growth is one of those but it's not all of them. There are 17 different ones. So they're, they're, and again, it goes to that multi-dimensionality of, of value, of um, public welfare, what makes people happy. Um, and I think from the public sector perspective, this is really, really critical because we need, we need um, in the UK, we have the Green Book, which kind of steers and guides how we look at uh, costs and benefit appraisals. Um, and it's changing and it's evolving and it's fantastic that we've just recently had guidance on well-being. And it, it does very clearly state in our Green Book that public welfare is the end goal. And we can't mix that up with, uh, um, with wealth. That is, welfare and wealth are quite different things and how we measure those two things are quite different. So we need to start to implement some of those really great theories and actually start using them empirically. And I think that's where we'll start to see change. You know, you mentioned multidimensionality of value and, and Douglas, you talk about embodied carbon analysis and, you know, these are some really heavy topics you're talking about here. How, how do you, in your experience, how do you go about sort of, I mean, I think you've done a great job here in the last few minutes, but when you, when you put it into maybe paper in your Heritage Counts publications or or in other media, how do you sort of deliver concise messages on these topics to sort of broader public or, or even policymakers? It's it's a difficult thing to do. Um, and it's something that we can always do better, I feel. Um, and there's no sort of, if, if you get to a point where you think you've got it right, then you, you, you're not doing it right because you should always be looking to, to, to make it better and, and, and improve upon it. And, so, so, so when it came with to, to, to our Heritage Council documents, um, one of the things that we, we really wanted to sort of push was to try and make it available to, to all people, as understandable as possible. So using visuals, using data in such a way that, that it can be um, understood and interpreted by not just somebody who's got years of training in it and, and that sort of educational background, but anybody who, who picks up the document can at least start to get an idea and an understanding. And having that level of education, like, educating and helping people educate themselves in, in this area will be really, really important to, to us successfully achieving the, the, those, goals that, those goals that we have. And through visuals, visuals are a, are a really, really powerful tool, um, but we can be better with that. And the number of times you'll, you'll, see, you'll, you'll, you'll come up with your visual and you'll give it the, the, the green light, and then six months later, you'll see somebody's done something similar, but even better, and it's just, <laughs> it just sort of pushes that, that 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 desire to try and make things as as better and, and as as accessible as possible, and um, it's, it's something that we've tried to do, and um, I think we've done we've done well, but I think we can do better and continue to do better, and I think that's really important that we we, we continue to do that. Yeah, and I think for us is you know 
as a team, we work in our analytics department and our goal is to ensure that the evidence we're producing is robust and it can help decision makers. And often when you're trying to produce some of the research around these really difficult topics, complex topics, which have, as I've mentioned, some very um, difficult theory behind them. So we always use kind of specialists who produce very, very technical documents. And then it's kind of really using, so we publish that information on our website. So it's accessible to those technical audiences that or just anyone who might be interested in those technical aspects. Um, and I think that's really important that we have the transparency around methods and data and all those kind of things and the limitations of those. We have to always be clear, whilst we have so much information and data, it's never perfect. It's not perfect. And it, you know, I, I, dare I say, I don't think it ever will be. And um, so we have to flag that there are margins of error in most of the research that happens. So all those kind of technical reports are, are put on our website. But one of the main things with Heritage Counts is it's a platform and a tool for us to kind of take the key messages and share them within the sector, but also outside the sector. Um, and that is really increasingly important as we talk about this kind of sort of triangulation between um, putting heritage in the middle of these really key aspects, which is the economy, the environment and society. So I think what we try and do is have different levels of dissemination, um, making sure that members of the public can also access some of these um, really critical messages, because actually most of our heritage is in the ownership of private, it's in the hands of private owners. And these are the custodians of our heritage, and we have to support them and help them. Um, and as Dougie said, though, it is really, really difficult because um, primarily because we're researchers, we can understand um, some of the technical aspects of what we present, but we have to then kind of tell the story. So where we are at the moment is we are we're reviewing how we produce heritage counts. And really trying to think of different ways because there is just so much information out there. People can't read uh, long reports that are 60 pages long or whatever it might be. So it's how do we uh, continue to be robust, continue to have the technical aspects clear to those who need it, but also continue to, to support these custodians of heritage. No, that's great. Well, thank you very much both for joining us. Uh, I'd like to just wrap up by asking you each, in your estimation, what does the future look like or what should it look like in terms of sustainability and conservation of the built environment? Right. That's not a difficult question at all. <laughs> um, I think what it should look like is some of the this kind of, for me, from an economic perspective, is moving towards this kind of more dashboard look of what um, what success is you know we need to definitely definitely move beyond gdp we, we need to move our cost benefit analyses beyond some of the metrics that we use today we need to embrace this culture and heritage capital approach that we're starting to look into which is about looking at beyond sort of our use values as we call them of uh, linked to the market prices of different aspects of services and goods in society today, including um, the historic environment. Um, and we need to start to better reflect people and people's well-being. And the environment is, of course, a critical, critical element of that. So we need to better understand how we build those things into our decisions, because ultimately, um, it's about, within economics, we're really thinking about how we allocate finite resources. Um, the environment is a finite resource, so it's a really important aspect of what we do, but we need to do better, and we urgently need to do those things better. So um, I see the future now that we're going to see a ramping up of kind of these new methods, these new techniques, these new models, and actually empirically applying them um, and seeing more global cooperation around those kind of um, the um, 
the inclusion of these things in in everything and every good and service we we produce and also from a consumer side is when we consume we need to start thinking harder um but we need good information to tell us um what the carbon footprint of the goods and services we're consuming is and i can see that coming i'd uh, i'd agree with a lot of what as well <laughs> with all of what Adal has just said one of the things that um, i think super well, really really important um relates to collaboration and um working um not just within the sector but also outwards and, and with other sectors because ultimately um there are so many different skill sets different um, knowledge sets um, that exist um, throughout uh, our organization the sector there are so many people out there who are all focused on on the same thing i think the the majority of us want to see us combat climate change and and have a better world to live in in not just the next five ten years but for generations to come but i think that can only be achieved through through collaboration through um working with other people with other ideas and some of those ideas we might not agree with and we have to have those conversations but i think the only way you can sort of affect things is if you bring people along with you and having those conversations and working collaboratively really, um is for me so so important especially when you're looking at something which is at a national level at a global level it's something that impacts us all we have to work together to do that um and for, for me <laughs> in a good sense uh, the future should look like uh, a place where we all collaborate if not then i could tell you some <laughs> negative views about what the world will end up looking like but i think if we do go down that avenue of, of working with other people and listening and talking then there's no reason why we can't see success in, in um, sustaining and, and conserving the built environment.